Like we said, we have Michelle Duby here. She's the Chief Clinical Officer at Landmark Recovery, which is the number one addiction treatment center here in Kentucky. It was voted by Newsweek last year, so we're very proud about that. But Michelle is also a, a licensed clinical social worker, a certified trauma specialist, and someone who can really provide you insight into what it's like and what the tips they can give you and your family for someone who may be facing substance use disorder. So I just want to welcome you, Michelle, and thank you so much for being here today. Great, thanks. I'm super happy to be here. Awesome. So you're actually lived for a long time here in Louisville, so you know the community so well and you've been a big part of it and have since moved to Nashville, but can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in the behavioral health space and what your time was when you were here in Louisville, what that was like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, fun fact about me, when I started college, I was a fine arts major and then I took an abnormal psychology class and that kind of signed the deal on what I was going to spend the rest of my career doing. Um, I came here to Louisville um, to attend my social work school at the University of Louisville, uh, Kent School of Social Work. And I started with Landmark Recovery about six years ago. Um, I've been working in the substance use disorder space my, my entire career, which I don't want to say out loud how many years is that, because it really ruins the illusion that I'm 29. Yep. Um, uh, but it's been, uh, you know, being in this, this community, when I, when I graduated from my social work program, um, it was right at the beginning of the opioid epidemic. And uh, it was just such a emerging need to have qualified and professional treatment for people with substance use disorders and co-occurring disorders such as trauma related or anxiety, depression, you know, things that always kind of go hand in hand with substance use disorders. That's something you, you bring up the opioid crisis and that's something that here in Kentucky is very prevalent. A lot of you may not know that over the past year we've seen the highest rate of overdoses we've ever seen since we started tracking this data in the 90s. And Kentucky actually rates fourth as having the fourth highest amount of overdoses just here in the state. So Landmark Recovery is a great resource here in the community. We work with all major insurances but also Medicaid to be sure that no one is left behind and that we help shore up those gaps of people who need the help uh, and that we're there to support them. Something that I think is really important is understanding what the signs of addiction are, um, either within yourself or in your family or your friends as well. And you know, we are at a women's expo and I feel that the women in our community are our caretakers and they're really important to be on the front line to help us see these signs. So if Michelle, you could walk us through maybe some of the some of the signs that we may not think about or know about um, when someone may be dealing with addiction. Great, yeah. Um, so I mean, some of the biggest things that we can start to notice is someone's change in, in their behavior. Um, it could be change in their physical appearance. Maybe they've lost weight. Sometimes they've gained weight, depending on the substance that they're using. Um, I always think someone who isn't able to adequately attend to their ADLs, which is activities of daily living, maybe their clothing is, is different, they're dressing differently, hanging with different people, um, their friend group has changed or their social group has changed, or perhaps they're not social at all anymore and they used to be social and now they're a little bit more isolative and they're at home. Um, you know, changes in mood, demeanor, um, there's so many different things that we kind of just don't necessarily know off and you'll go, oh, well, that's just life and we change, but they can be signs and symptoms. How can someone, if we see some of these signs or if we have an inkling of something, and if you're like me, you don't really know how to intervene or how to approach that topic with someone, it may be someone who isn't a, um, a parent figure, it may be someone younger, so there is kind of a, a different approach, I assume, for, for someone, how they're related to you or a friend like that. So how might I go about speaking to someone that I feel needs my help or, or, or needs to be provided the resources or, or helped out? How, how can I go about speaking to them and what's appropriate? Yeah, I always say that the best approach is to be as kind of safe and non-judgmental as possible. Someone who is experiencing substance-related issues, substance use disorders, is often ready for that person to kind of, you know, uh, the, the classic intervention. Like this is an intervention, and this is tough love, and we're gonna we're gonna get you and force you to do this. And it's really the, the natural 
you know, response to that is to push back and go, no, I don't want you to tell me what to do. Um, so let them know you see them, that you're there, you see these changes, you recognize these changes, and that you're a safe, supportive person for them for whatever next step that they might have. That might not be the same step that you think that they need, but any step forward is a step in the right direction. So being a safe, non-judgmental space for them to be able to talk about what might really be going on. That's really great advice. And I think something that really has stuck with me in working in this space is that you hear people say that addiction um, is a symptom of something deeper. It's, it's, it's often confused as the, the main problem or, or the disease itself. But as we uncover those layers and, and we, we go through recovery, we, we provide tools and, and different solutions, but they're to problems that might actually lie deeper. Can you talk about just how the role that trauma plays in addiction? So I think we often just disregard people who may be struggling with drug or alcohol use as um, this is a choice, this is something that you know I'm not dealing with, so it, it can't be that hard. Why don't they just stop? But I think it's really important to understand what those underlying contributing factors are, if you could kind of walk us through those. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people always ask, which came first, the, the trauma or the response? And it's, you know, it doesn't really matter because they're both here right now, so we have to kind of deal with both at the same time. Um, most of the time when we, obviously there's some biological um, and some, some, you know, it's a disease of addiction, so there are some, some drivers that are, are biological, but they're often triggered by if we've experienced a traumatic event, which a lot of people think, well, I wasn't in combat, I wasn't significantly abused. Well, well trauma is subjective to the individual. It is about having an event that is extreme, and our response to it is maladaptive, meaning that we struggle to cope with it effectively. And so often drugs and alcohol are a super easy way to feel better, right? We want to, um, you know, we're feeling anxious, we're feeling depressed. We have a drink, we have a drug, and we instantly feel better. And so we develop a maladaptive coping pattern based on this, this feeling that we had related to an event that occurred maybe in our childhood. And um, one of the biggest things that we focus on at Landmark Recovery is something called adverse childhood experiences. And adverse childhood experiences are events that happen to us from you know ages zero to 18 that we might not recognize as, tra as potentially traumatic. You know, having, um, a parent who is incarcerated, is living in a violent neighborhood, there's lots of things that can happen to us that we might not see as trauma that definitely drive those behaviors. So it's super, you know, so it's super important to be able to say, hey, I've developed this maladaptive coping skill. I'm drinking, I'm drugging to deal with my emotions. How can I learn how to more effectively, how can I develop adaptive coping behaviors that will help me, you know, not hurt myself and the people around me, but be able to handle my emotions and be able to handle life on life's terms. I think it's really important too to understand what happens after you have that discussion or that first step in someone recognizing that they need help. Um, I think, you know, we, a lot of us assume, or the first step is detox, you know, you're going to go detox these drugs out of your system, and then, you know, we're kind of there, and, and you're fine, but recovery is a journey, and the detox is often maybe the first step, but it's, it's not the only thing to, to consider when you're looking to find resources for recovery. So, if I have someone, a loved one, or a friend, or a family member who is struggling with substance use, what are those resources I should be looking for and, and what are those types of programs that would be all inclusive to anyone's need but also more focused on those underlying factors and, and really aiming to have recovery in the long term and not just something that's quick and, and easy because as we know recovery is not easy and it's, it's important that uh, we all create communities that are inclusive and supportive of this. So. Uh, I'd love to know more just about what you do once you've had those discussions and you're seeking out resources. Uh, what should I be looking for? Yeah, um, I mean, one is that there's lots of different levels of care along the continuum of, of the you know journey to recovery. Most people, you know, the recommendation is to have a, a year of continuous treatment, if not more beyond that. So you have kind of that initial acute phase, which might look like detox. I mean, to answer kind of the first, what is the first step? 
find a professional that can help you in that journey. That professional could be an individual therapist. That's a great place to start. Um, but some people might need a larger organization to be able to go and have a, a safe detox somewhere like Landmark where we can do that. It's also great to find someone who can do all of the things in, in one care setting. So you don't have to change providers and necessarily go to different people, tell your story time and time again. So you know we've created a full continuum of care from all the way from our, our highest level of, of safe medical detox through a long-term um, outpatient care setting where someone can stay with us for a year, stay with the same therapist and, and be able to not have to tell their story time and time again from the very, very beginning. I think that that is really impressive that you know, I, I didn't know coming into this space that you, if you are struggling that you have to move to multiple places. It may be a hospital or a therapist's office and go on and so forth. But I think something that's very unique about Landmark is that continuum of care and that safe space that's all-inclusive of those needs. Everything from detox to inpatient, outpatient, even partial hospitalization in some cases. Um, I think something that uh, I really love about Landmark is how we try to uplift the stories of recovery, and often in this community, we hear a lot about the bad things, right? We hear about the tragedies and we hear about the struggles, but we also have a lot of successes and we have a lot of beautiful, joyful stories that also need to be told. And that's something I personally love is that recovery can be a joyful experience. It can be an experience of, of reclaiming things that once were. So can we talk a little bit more about like what happens after recovery, you know, you've, you've seen the success and, and you've uh, hit milestones, but recovery again is long term. So what does it look like after you leave somewhere like Landmark Recovery? Yeah, um, I mean, it can look like a lot of different things. I, I think the, the biggest thing is that we're, we're still engaging in those healthy habits that we, we built during our, our treatment. Um, it's also kind of developing a support network. It's very important to develop a support network that is healthy, supportive of the journey that you're on, and, and helps you continue to, to make those same strides daily. You know, we say you're not recovered, you're in recovery. It's a it's a something that we practice. It gets easier. Like uh, you know, we when we first drove a car. It was like, oh my God, I'm driving a car. This is crazy, and I have to really think about all the things that I'm doing. The longer that we're in recovery, the more it becomes just just part of who we are, and it's the things that we do every day. But it really does help to have you know a support network in place, having a, a provider that's able to you know continue to work through um, not just the substance use disorder, but again those co-occurring. You know, anxiety, depression that you know might continue to need treatment once we've been able to get detox and get initially kind of sober, um, be able to kind of continue to work on those, and um, you know, give back. I think one of the biggest things that, that helps people on that journey is to be able to go back in. We have an alum, a very robust alumni program that is free to anyone that's come through our program. And the, the most important thing that we have is we have alumni that return to the facilities and kind of help and volunteer their time. It helps them give and do kind of what we call service work and give back and give back to the, the place that helped them or give back to the people that helped them. But it's also a really wonderful opportunity to kind of look and go, oh my gosh, you know, a year ago this is what I was looking like and kind of seeing people in those first couple days where it's like, hey, it does get better and hey, life does look better. But it's a good reminder on both sides. Like for those inside kind of getting early stages of, of care, they're like, wow, life, like recovery is possible and I am worthy of, of a life worth living. But they also are, you know, the people that are coming back in can go, oh my gosh, that, that could be me again if I don't keep up this, this, what I, this life that I've built for myself. That's awesome. What can we do as friends and family members for, for people that we love who are in recovery? How, you know, if I'm having a barbecue this summer, what's appropriate for me? Do I, do I need to tiptoe around someone or do I need to myself uh, become more educated on the topic? Or, you know, what's expected of us as the friends and family members of those in recovery to help them on a successful journey? Yeah, and I think it's recognizing, so if we're doing events like barbecues or parties, you know, being aware, especially of someone, I think it's, it's, you know, making sure if they're, you know, struggling with alcohol use, try not to, you know, have a lot of alcohol around or recognize that they might need to bring a sponsor or a friend or someone that's there to support them and not 
to give him crap about like why are you bringing Judy with you well I need Judy to kind of help me navigate this event because she helps me focus and be able to, to not go to the cooler that has beer in it um, I think it's also one of the most important things that we can do as family and supports is we set very clear boundaries with our family uh, with our individuals in recovery and let them know what you know what is it that we're going to do to support them and what behaviors are we not going to support and, and keeping those boundaries and, and, and holding our person accountable while still loving the crap out of them. I love that, loving the crap out of them. I think um, Landmark is a very unique or, uh, company to begin with but something that I found really inspirational is that it is a recovery friendly workplace. There are p many people within the organization who have themselves uh, been on a journey of recovery and to me who better to help those uh, with the similar struggle than those who have been through it so I think that that's something very unique and especially here in Louisville where we do have um, two facilities um, just knowing that there is a huge family of people who are going to be there to support you and who even though they may have never met you are going to be rooting for you because they've been on that journey themselves um, what is it do you think that you love most about Landmark Recovery and you've actually, like you said, lived in Louisville so you know this, this community very intimately and um, uh, what do you think is the, the most exciting thing about Landmark or, or that makes it most different um, in the care that they provide? Um, I mean, there's a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> But I think one of the biggest things about Landmark Recovery, and when I came to Landmark, you know, six years ago, was the, the biggest thing that, that happens is, is we lose our humanity and we lose our hope in active addiction. And we believe we're not, we're not worth this life that's out there. And so it's easy to lose focus and it's easy to give up. And, and the number one thing that, that we've done at, at Landmark and was very important that we built as part of our philosophy is we're never going to get mad at someone because you're, 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 you're you know, presenting, maybe I call it symptoms that are consistent with your diagnosis, right? So you're depressed and you're laying in bed and we're like, get, get in the group or you're getting kicked out. It's like, well, you're depressed. So what can we do to help get you out of this bed? Or what can we, do we need to come in and have group in your room with you? Um, because we're trying to meet people where they're at, restore their humanity, restore their hope. I always hope anyone that leaves our program, you know, learn, there's a huge curriculum of tools, but if they leave believing that they are a person that is worthy of change and worthy of a different life, we have done our job. And, and then they can continue to build those skills once they leave, but if they know they're worth it, that's all that matters to me. That's Not awesome. all. But. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being here today. I think you're true inspiration, and um, I think you're making really great impact in communities like Louisville here um, who are seeing uh, disproportional effects of the opioid crisis. So I just want to thank you for being here and sharing your insight, and I want to thank all of you who sat and, and, and listened to this tough conversation, but something that hopefully will be uplifting and, and uh, a tool that you can use and adopt in your own life. So I want to thank you all. and. Have a great rest of your time here at the Louisville Women's Expo.